How's it going? Andrew here and welcome to The Creative Endeavor, the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to Bethany Veer, who's a young equine artist based in the United Kingdom. Now, Bethany does some exquisite colored pencil art, and I normally don't gravitate towards colored pencil at all, but she really can make colored pencil talk. I just love seeing her work on Instagram, and she seems to be not only creating amazing art, but she's also created a fantastic, thriving business, selling her animal portraits around the world. I wanted to hear about how she makes it work as a business, but also a little bit about her personal story and how she finds herself in the position she's in today. This was a great conversation. I really got a lot out of it, and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's Bethany Veer in The Creative Endeavor. Well, Bethany Veer, welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Why don't you just kick things off for us and tell us a little bit more about your art and your story and what has led you up to this point in your career that you find yourself in now? Okay, well, firstly, thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege to be asked to do something like this. Um, So I have been a full-time artist for around about four years. I have been, well, for those of you who don't know my work, already. I am a coloured pencil artist. I specialise in equestrian portraiture um, and the sort of like the anatomy of the horse, getting sort of as close to realism as I possibly can with coloured pencil. Um, So as I said, I've been doing this about four years and it's been a complete roller coaster. Um, And yeah, I don't even know really where to start. Um, But I am completely self-taught. I didn't go to art school. Um, I actually failed art at college, um, which is, I don't know if it's the same in New Zealand, but college isn't university over here. It's sort of like a mid-school. And they failed me because they wanted me to do a lot of abstract work. And I was just never really into that kind of stuff. So I stuck my pencils and they weren't happy and they basically failed me. Um, And ever since then, like, I come from a very corporate background and my parents are sort of working in office like an office environment so for me to be an artist was just like no basically so when I left school I went into the motor trade and I was working at like the Citroen and Mercedes-Benz and I loved it at the time but it really wasn't a long-term career path um and then I went to university to study marketing and dropped out after a year and a half because I kind of realized that I'm really not academic Um, and in that time I'd always ridden horses I've always had such a passion for animals and especially horses Um, so I kind of was always drawing them because my parents never let me have my own pony and so I'd just go out to like a yard or my friend's horses um, and sit there and basically just study them really and it kind of gave me a lot of inspiration to sort of draw I guess because I think growing up I was quite an anxious child and especially going into my sort of later teenage years with the pressure of social media and things like that I was struggling a lot um with sort of like not I don't want to say like finding yourself but you know the battles that you kind of struggle with as a as a sort of like a teenager um and art was such an escape I was never really a party goer um I never really went clubbing or anything like that I'd much rather spend a Saturday night drawing and that's exactly what I did and it kind of got to my as I said my second year of university I was halfway through and I really really wasn't happy and it got to Christmas and I kind of said to my parents like uni isn't for me it's a huge amount of money it's a huge amount of debt it's really not what I want to do and they said well fine but what else are you going to like what what are you going to do basically um and at the time I sort of built up a relatively mediocre portfolio um if you look sort of at my previous really early work it's like I sort of started uh, started in graphite and um just experimenting with so many mediums like pastel oils um but I always came back to pencil because I love the like the uh, precision that you can get from a pencil um so yeah I think they were like I remember my mum saying to me you know you're good but it's 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 a difficult journey and I don't think you're really prepared for being an artist and 
you know, can you even make a career out of it? There's a lot of people out there doing this. Where would you even start? And I kind of went, well, I, I, I don't know, but I can take a year out of university that I can hold my place. Um, and then you can come back uh, if it doesn't work out. So I basically, in short, gave myself a year to try and get a portfolio together to try and make some money by art. And I had like a part time job at, at the time I was working in a pub and um yeah, as I said, I, I gave myself a year to basically get get the business off the ground to some to some form, basically. Um, and in that year, it was it was tough, um, really really tough. Because as I said, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do oils or pastels or pencils or anything like that. Um, and I spent a lot of money to get a lot of different sort of mediums and just experiment. I spent so many like so much time experimenting, but. Um, I then went on to start a Facebook page because I started posting work on Facebook and it it got a bit of a sort of a a response from friends and family and they were like oh this is really good like and then some of my friends that I had horses with who I went and rode their horses they say oh can I can you draw my horse for me and I said yeah okay so I, I went off and sort of drew did start the drawing and did the um artwork and eventually I was like okay well maybe I can maybe I can charge like 20 pounds or something um and so I, I started and, and that's basically how I kind of started getting commissions and I started a Facebook page and I started putting work on Facebook and I started getting a bigger following um very very slowly uh, sort of like friends and their friends and it kind of expanded locally to going bigger and bigger and bigger um and I think it was probably about a year and a half in when I completely slumped and I didn't I had um quite I, I made a bit of a mistake when I started the business um I went to a company to get some prints made of some equestrian work that I did and basically got charged a stupid amount of money for the work um I was kind of lied to about the price of because I think uh the the, the company um told me one price and then when the invoice came it they'd added VAT on and things like that but me being sort of first first time business owner or startup business and 20 years old I didn't have a clue about VAT and sort of add-on costs of things and things like that um, and there was a lot of sort of hidden prices and things like that so yeah it kind of got um I lo- well I, I lost quite a substantial amount of money through getting a lot of these prints made and I was very naive to thinking that it's fine. I can just put them on Facebook and people are going to buy them because, you know, people are very complimentary about my work. So eventually, you know, if I put it online, someone might buy them. It didn't happen. I kind of launched everything. I'd spent a lot of money. I launched prints, nothing. So I went to this company and had a lot of prints made and they basically sold me the dream. They told me that they could put me into in touch with a lot of different people and that um what else did they tell me they just you know when you go see a company and they just tell you well they tell you everything you want to hear they kind of see you coming basically um, and I was so young at the time as well like, oh, this was only four years ago but I feel like it was such a long time ago um so yeah I think he kind of was like I can promise you this this is going to happen and um, if you work with me and, and he said to me don't don't release anything to the last minute so I want you to do a collection of like 18 pieces of work you could, you're gonna have a big portfolio yeah 18 pieces of work big portfolio we can get loads of prints made and I, I was like oh okay okay because I don't know anything about art and you you're a fine art printer so you deal a lot with this um yeah and then there was a lot of hidden costs involved. He started adding on VAT to the prices that he initially told me. And me being really naive and being like a start a business, I didn't have a clue. Um, and so I got slapped with all of these invoices and I had no choice. I had to pay them. And you know, thousands of pounds later, I was distraught. I was completely like devastated. It was like savings are gone, everything. And I, I felt like I'd wasted so much money. This, I didn't know whether this career was going to work, whether it even was a career. Because after then, I took my work. Um, I approached a publisher, relatively local publisher to me. Um, and I took my, this portfolio down there. I said, look, I've had all these prints made. Could you help me possibly sell them? Like, how, I don't really know how it works. And they went, mm, mm, no, basically, no, we don't like your work. 
And I was like, oh, okay, okay. So it was just knock after knock after knock. Um, and my parents were going, well, maybe go back to uni or go and get a proper job. Um, and yeah, I was determined because I'm a bit stubborn. And I was like, no, I'm going to make it work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going to give it. And I've got another six months before I need to be back at uni or, you know, however long it was. I'm going to try and nail this. Um, so I took, I took a bit of time off. As I said, I was working at a pub, so I didn't really have like the concern of being desperate for money. Um, so I think I, I took about two months away from drawing full stop. I was demoralized. I just couldn't even pick up a pencil. Um, and then after that, it was after, just after the, no, actually I'd started seeing some people do work online, like on Instagram and stuff like that, on uh, colored pencil and black paper. And I thought, oh, that looks quite nice. I'm going to give that a go. So I started posting things like that onto Facebook and I got some, I got commissions that way. And it, my uh, people in America, I started getting people in America and overseas interested in commissions. And I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe, maybe this is, this is good. Um, because like the print, all the prints that I'd had done previously, like company I put them onto Facebook and none of them had sold like I'd launched them I'd done it followed what this guy told me to a T and I was kind of expecting oh I don't was I naively expecting maybe I was naively expecting that someone would come along and just almost like feel sorry for me and just be like oh you know I know her I'm gonna buy a piece of work and support her because like we've been friends for years it doesn't work like that unfortunately and I learned that the hard way um and I was so like, really really naive um so as I said, none of the prints were sold. I was really demoralized. I started, but luckily I found this colored, like colored pencil on black paper and I started doing some work um, and selling it to America and just doing some little like original sketches, like white on black almost, and just, just making some money just to prove to people that I could do it. I could make money that people, someone was interested in buying something that I had to produce, that I produced. Um, but that fell short pretty quickly because it was just a consistent turnover, like new piece of work every single day, sketch upon sketch upon sketch. And I was just like, well, this is tiring. I can't do this. This isn't sustainable, basically. Um, so that was, I think that that was when I took a bit of time out and I it was during the summer and I watched the Rio Olympics. And I've always, as I said, loved horses, been fascinated by dressage. And um, I watched Charlotte Dujardin and Vallegro compete. And I fell in love with, like, I followed Vallegro and Charlotte to a little, to, to, to a degree, but nothing that, you know, not, not, not that strongly. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I watched the Olympics and fell completely in love with the horse. And then I found some, like, it's photography, like, photography online. I met a photographer and I said, look, I don't think anything is going to like come of it basically but can I could I just use your photography as a reference for a piece of artwork that I want to do and he very kindly said yes um so I by which time I'd done some research into uh, pencils and paper that other people were using that I was really inspired by online um and on Instagram and things like that and I was like right okay I'm gonna I'm gonna nail this piece I'm gonna take time over it I'm gonna really sort of like just experiment and see how how well I can do a drawing basically and I got halfway through doing this drawing of Charlotte and Vallegro and I decided that I was going to bite the bullet and put it online and put it on Facebook and just put it on there and just see what happened like just see what response it got basically because I, as I said I've been quiet for several months and I was really nervous so I used to get so nervous about putting my work like pressing the publish button online was so so scary because you're opening yourself up to like criticism so people were, like judging you it was like it was scary it's I did. terrifying I put doing it. that it's terrifying yeah yeah, yeah it's horrible um but I did and I think 24 hours later or a day or so later I was sat in my room like watching Netflix or something not thinking about work not thinking about business not thinking about anything and my phone like pop, like messaged well, it was sort of pinged and um I had a message from my, my Facebook page and it said Charlotte Dujardin like has sent you a message and I was like this Olympic gold medalist wow. apparently has sent me a message and I was a bit like mm, I don't believe that wow. I don't believe you're real um, but I opened the message and she basically said, hi, Bethany, um, I've just seen that you're drawing Vallegro. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I was like, oh, my God, I ran around the house. So Sunday night, about nine o'clock at night, 
running around the house like screaming being like my idols just messaged me like what on earth um and then in her next message so I obviously I obviously replied and um we me and between me and my parents we sort of drafted out a very careful message being like thank you so much I'm gonna say glad you like it and all of this and then she messaged me back and she said would you like to when the drawing's finished would you like to come and meet us at at our yard and I was like oh my god this is amazing it was like fangirl moment absolute fangirl moment um so yeah and I kind of this is I think about three years it's been now and I've worked with her the team GB dressage team and I've recently got a Dominican Republic um Olympian um I'm doing some work for Germany and I'm also doing some work from Australia as well um and that sort of like, I, I just so much that has happened in, in ever since I started working with Charlotte, like the opportunities and things like that. And I'm so very, very grateful for her support. Um, but it shows you that like, things like can happen from Facebook, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's basically how I got started. And I, I, I genuinely think, I'm very, as I said, I'm very, very fortunate to have a push from someone like that. But I truly believe that if you want something enough, you'll make it work. You really will make it work. That is such an inspiring story. I think there's there's a lot of people out there that build up this idea of of being an artist and being a professional and, and you know walking the creative path. They build this up as a fantasy okay. in their mind, thinking about how wonderful it's going to be. And it does have its wonderful moments, but what you're saying there is there's a... a a lot of heartache and a lot of having the door slammed in your face and hearing no a lot of times and you know what you've done through that that barrage of of negative feedback and and circumstances is you you stuck to your guns and you kept going you kept the dream and the vision alive and sometimes i I don't know i don't want to get too woo woo this early in the podcast but sometimes i feel like life uh, even you know the universe to use that that common expression now it's almost a conscious thing it's pushing back against you as hard as you're pushing the thing and it's just yeah. waiting to see how bad do you really want this and I, I that's just so ridiculously inspiring bethany to hear that you know you, you got that feedback but from the person that it mattered most yeah, how absolutely. cool is that that's amazing it was, incredible. Uh, it, was a, it was an absolutely incredible experience and to sort of uh, like the work as i said that i've picked up from that it's been insane as well. The opportunities that I've been given is 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 mental. Um, but I mean, just because you know there was a lot of heartache and at, at at the start, basically. But also, even when you do get your the, your dream clients, almost there's still a lot of problems that come with not 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 necessarily those clients, but but you know other people. Um, there was still so many rejections. There's still you know you get approached by like for me for example I use a local framer who are supplied by a lot of the uh, bigger publishers in the UK and one of the biggest publishers in the UK went into that framers and they saw my artwork they saw I did a um a piece of six hunting hounds and they saw it they had put some frames of print down there and they said oh who's, who's done that we really like it and um then they messaged, well, they emailed me and said, do you want to come up to Birmingham, which is about a three hour drive from me um, and have a meeting with the board and, you know, we'll see whether we can get you into a couple of our galleries. And they've got some of the biggest galleries in the cities in in the UK. And I was like, oh, what an opportunity. This is amazing. Like I'm going for leaps. So I I took my portfolio up there um, and took a lot of framed work and I had a meeting with them and they basically turned around and said, uh yeah we really like what you do we really like what you do however you're very much a commission artist aren't you and I kind of went yeah and they went you're not a commercial artist. we want commercial artists so we kind of want you to learn to paint we want you to put backgrounds on things we want you to like smudge everything out a bit and I went well that's 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 not what I do that is oh. you know um and they said, well, you know, go away, have a bit of a think, maybe like take some time out, build another portfolio. And so I did, because um, I would, because obviously getting approached by a big publisher in the UK was it was a huge deal. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to listen to them because they clearly know what they're talking about with art. Um, 
and I went and spent another like two months in between things uh built another portfolio and just tried and I sent them piece after piece after piece and I rejected every single one of them and I went do you know what I'm like you can't change me then like if if I've tried um and then I remember speaking to a lot of people and they said like why why are you trying to change like you've built a, an audience you've you've got a client base like just because one publisher and you like do you really want to be a gallery artist and I kind of said no I love working with the clients I work with the, with the dressage team that that's that's me through and through so yeah I mean it's been a lot of a lot of sort of like roller coasters but overall I think yeah I, I'm sat here in in my room and sort of my studio room with all my pencils around me and sort of like just all my equipment I think oh I'm so lucky yeah, to be able to be here and to be yeah even to be asked to be on your podcast and think of like that it's just an, incredible uh, yeah. no, <laughs> no don't, don't put this up there as a highlight uh, but uh, look it, the, <laughs> it definitely is it definitely is the, the pleasure is mine I assure you um you know it's um it's interesting to hearing that because I, I can relate to so many aspects of that story. And again, there's a lot of common threads that come through for so many people in their careers, you know, from, from doing the printing and, and thinking that this is going to be some sort of easy thing and then falling into a trap. Um, I've fallen into that trap a couple of times now. And, and then to even have people try and exert their creative control on what you do. But Coming full circle now, looking at what you do now and, and your business the way it looks now, uh, it, it's incredible. Now, again, I know I'm on the outside looking in, but you're, you're now producing this steady flow of work that is exceptionally well executed. It is so like polished and pristine, just precise, and, and your yeah. technique is 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 unreal. So you. could you, before we do a deeper dive into the business side of things of how you make it work as an artist, could you tell us a little bit more about your process? Now, I, I must admit, I, I, I will say from the outset, personally, not a fan of colored pencil, but really? you make colored pencils talk. That <laughs> the, the way you do it, because at first I looked at them and went, those are nice paintings. Like that is an incredible <laughs> painting. How did she do? What's her technique? I'm like colored pencil. No, get get <laughs> out of here, really. And but you you really you make that medium work for you. And I think it's up to the artist, every artist, to find the material and the medium that works for them, so that they can express themselves in the way they see fit. You found yeah. that. So could you talk us through your process a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Well, as I said in the, at the start, like I, I kind of went through um, coloured pencils and, and pastels and, and oils and I kind of realised very quickly that oils are messy and I don't like them, they smell and things like that. So, and pastels are really messy as well. Um, but uh, I mean, it's incredible because I see such beautiful work by, done by so many different mediums, but I always, as I say, come back to coloured pencil because I mean, I can't, sharpen a pastel pencil like I can sharpen one of my pencils because the leads are so much harder so when it comes to the process I mean the way because I I have quite a few people message me and say you know how do you do what you do and you know can, what what's your advice and techniques and I just say patience and layering just lay it lay it get a thick I use um a hot press watercolor paper and it's the heaviest weight I can get and it's the heaviest weight I can buy and it's really it's not this I don't even know how you describe it it's heavy um and I can put so many layers in but I think I mean I'm quite heavy-handed I think anyway um and I think even now I mean I I don't know whether you or well, anyone will know, um, but I'm currently working on Charlotte's um, Tokyo 2020 Olympic mare, um, Mount St. Oh, John wow. Freestyle. And um, yeah, which is which is incredible like to be doing a piece like that. Amazing, um, cool. And it's, but it's so intense. It's so, it's so many hours. I think that's one of the things with colour pencil is that it takes so long. I mean, I've been working on this piece on and off for approximately, a month now I've done a trade show in between then and I've also done some commission work but it's been over a month now and it's fine I'm about three days away from finishing it and but that's you know it's only about I think it's about the the paper I buy is like 24 inches by 28 inches and I think that's one of the reasons why publishers and galleries aren't interested in people that do color pencil because it takes so 
long. It takes so long to cover an area, to build up the layers, to get sort of the depth to everything. Because in my mind, the, what way makes um, art realistic isn't really the, your um, skill or the detail, if, although it helps, it's your values. And, you know, your darks have got to be dark and your lights have got to be light. And that That's creates right. a highlight and creates, creates the... Um, the illusion that you're sort of making something as 3D as you can possibly make it on, on a flat surface. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, and I, I'm really fortunate that I've kind of learned over the years how to lay a pencil in, in such a way that I can create. I know when to go heavy on a, on a, sort of on a dark area and I know when to sort of be very gentle. Um, but one of the things like that I think a lot of people struggle with colored pencil is they uh, is the when you do lay it, it can be, look quite muddy sometimes. So you've got to kind of know, get a feel for what pencils work well together, what colors will layer on top of each other well. Um, but that takes time and experimenting and, and a lot of patience. And I think that's one of the things with colored pencil is that you is so precise um, that and you can make mistakes, but it's not easy to correct them whereas with paint or not I know not watercolors because obviously it's very different difficult to lighten up a watercolor um but especially with oils and for stuff like that if you go dark you can lighten it the same with acrylic and same with pastel um but with pencils you're working highlights backwards almost so you know you plot out where your highlights are and then you go into your shadows and you sort of work at your midtones um it's really crazy because I don't really think about um my work as art um, so when I talk to you about mid-tones and shadows and tones and valleys and things like that, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I just create, I just draw a horse. Do you know, I, and I think that's what's, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully I've kind of explained it a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I just definitely kind of just, I, I'm pointing down here because of my freestyle is down here and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, well, um, you yeah, know, just go really ham on some bits and really heavy and then really light and sort of, yeah, gentle to to where you need the where you need the highlights. Well, I think that's extraordinary. I mean, I, I I can certainly yeah see that it would be a very unforgiving medium. But again, you you make it work for you, and and that's the main thing. And now you've got something that is a, a business that is definitely working for you, um, which is which is incredible. Again, so maybe could you talk to us about that because I find that so interesting. You know, you've got. You, you receive that criticism from from th those people that are, were saying, OK, well, you're a commission based artist. You're, you're somebody that produces something that, you know, people want to buy as a, as a finished work of art. You're not somebody that we can mold and fit into our mm -hmm. little you know, paradigm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you be somebody else. But now now that you've found your your artistic voice, so to speak, or a niche, how does it work for you as a business? Is this merely just a question of, of just, yeah, you, you put something online and somebody bites, you know, just almost like fishing, you put your, your hook in the water and somebody comes along and bites and then it becomes down to, to sheer volume and that increases your chances. Because I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to just say from the outset, I, I suspect not because, and I will just say this, one of the things that I'm so impressed with, with you is when looking at your website, you seem to have mastered both the personal interfacing with the client and mm. being there with them and working with them directly, as well as having this online thing working. So as a business, could you just yeah. give us a snapshot for how this kind of works? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think for me, it's 50-50 between online sales and I mean, a lot about 99% of my commissioned work comes from social media. Well, not just on social media, but, you know, the website and things like that. Um, but and a lot of people would be recommended by uh, through Facebook. Um, so I, I think for the, for the commission stuff, I mean, it's, it is very much, it's, it's not the same as, obviously it's not the same as prints, but um, so prints, you are kind of fishing. You create a piece of artwork like to add to your portfolio that you kind of hope that people are going to bite and kind of buy. And it doesn't really work like that. Like over the past three, about two years, Facebook, in my opinion, has gone dramatically 
down um, in terms of they want you to pay more to advertise to sort of reach. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I've got quite a large following on, not massive, but you know, a relatively good following on um, Facebook. But to, for like, all of those people who follow me to see the work, Facebook wants me to pay them. And I'm like, mm, no no that's not that's not what what I expected um whereas years ago when I first started the business I could put a piece of work online and it, it would get a much bigger reach than what it gets now so and you know print sales back then two years ago were fantastic now not so good and it's it's um I think it's difficult because I very much love the horses and I very much love doing the equestrian work over things like the wildlife and um other stuff that I've done in the past but you kind of got to go well okay well the wildlife sells to people on Facebook it sells for print but it's a difficult um balance to get between commissions and prints I'm very very fortunate that I do have a very very steady workload of commissions um if anything it's it's you know very very busy which is brilliant I'm so fortunate to be in the position where I can say that you know commission work is thriving um and I do I am very lucky that as you said I I get to meet some if not quite a few um of my clients um and but you know the majority of them are local um and I take pride in building that rapport with the people that commission me um because it's, it's not just, oh, can you draw my pony? Yeah, sure, send me a photo, give me the money, then you know, I'll do the work, or you know, such and such like that. It's very much like we have a very good, um, I, build, I try and build a bigger and a stronger rapport as I possibly can with them um, in terms of even from the initial sort of emails to sort of help them get the right photography for the work, um, showing them sort of what examples of bad photography compared to good photography. Um, and, you know the process through through the work to um the packaging i take i try and take pride in obviously the packaging it's all tissue wrapped it's all ribboned it's all sort of handwritten it's you know it's a huge amount of work that goes into behind the scenes of being an artist as well um and but you know i think for me for example i get so many compliments on packaging and um the way that i build the rapport with the customers um whereas you don't kind of get that of through prints but then again um prints to me are like uh i guess like pocket money at, at the end of the day you kind of get a print sale and you're like oh excellent okay well you know that's afforded me to do x y and z um and i know that's talking purely on a monetary level um but I think that is the difference. Like, I'm very, very fortunate, as I said, that I, I've built a very good uh, relationship with a lot of my commissioned clients. And they are the people who, you know, at the end of the day, they're buying a piece of art, which they don't have to have. Um, and it's a luxury item. And you kind of want them to feel like they are investing well with their money because it's not a lot. It's not, like not a, not a little amount of money that they are spending. It's you know, depending on the size it can be quite a considerable amount um and you kind of want to make sure that you're building that rapport because you know even if it takes you the time that you don't necessarily have and you're thinking oh maybe I'm losing a bit of money here the relationship that you build with those customers are invaluable because they will talk and they will talk and publicity and it gets you further and further and further um and it's the same with print sales I mean you may, may get a print sale and everything's gift wrapped and everything is like properly done and you know thank you notes are written and you know it is it takes time but the amount of compliments the amount of thank you emails I get the amount of thank you cards is just phenomenal um and yeah I think I'm yeah as I said very very fortunate to be able to work on a personal level with some clients but also um to build a relationship with the people who buy my prints and stuff from instagram um because instagram as you're probably aware is like instagram's overtaking facebook now to be honest and especially in my opinion i mean i'm much more prolific on instagram than i am on any other platform but difficult me, me because yeah absolutely I, I could talk about i could talk about this for ages because i genuinely um don't really like social media at all um, I think it can be a real problem. But then again, without social media, I wouldn't have a business. And I'm, you know, I, I'm 
strongly can say that I have only got where I am through social media. That's interesting. That's interesting. I do want to go back to that and, and talk more about social media because I, 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 we, we might be very similar there in that respect because I do have some massive reservations about it. And I think it does things to us personally, you know, with, with the enormous gift that it brings, it also takes so much away. Yeah. Um, and it's important to maintain and, and retain some sort of element of ourselves, which we can lose so easily through these platforms. I, I do want to go back and just pick up on something that you said and just echo that, maybe maybe drive that point home for people that might be listening, because this is something that I've stumbled upon in recent years. And the thing that that I, I think you do you know exceptionally well is once you have a customer, once you have somebody that, that has parted with their hard earned money to own a mm-hmm. piece of your art, which they didn't have to have. And as you say, you know, it's a luxury item. Once they've done that, taking care of them in such a way that encourages them to come back is mm. absolutely essential. I heard something recently, which is we're not in the selling business. We're in the reselling business. And I didn't really understand that until I had looked at the, my own numbers within my business. Now, my father, I was very, very fortunate. My father trained me a lot, um, you know, when I was very young and and even helped me get set up as a professional. And people might remember him from episode 11 of the podcast. Um, But the the thing that, that my father was telling me was once you have somebody on the line, once somebody's bought, the chances are they're going to buy again. You got to take care of them. And you got to be grateful for them, and you got to treat them in such a way that encourages them to come back. But it can't, it can't be fake. It can't be done yeah. in such a way that you're, you're. I'm doing this for you because I'm expecting something back. It, you have mm. to be pouring out this genuine expression of gratitude. What Absolutely. ended up happening for me is, is, is that classic, you know, Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, where. of the people that had were buying at any given time already had a piece of work. 20% of the clients were new, but the majority of that 20% knew somebody who already had something. So it has this kind of this cross feeding, you know, spreading out effect where it really does become, you know, word of mouth business. That was a way that I found, you know, when interfacing with people on a personal level, that became so much more successful for me once I got out of the gallery. Um, yeah. Except I will say, you know, the, the exception being I had one gallery that I worked with directly, very closely, and I got to meet everybody. And, and, yeah. and then it just became a transaction where these people were friends of mine and we became very close. And I just said, look, you guys handle the business side of things. I'm happy to pay the commission, which was very <laughs> reasonable, just so I can keep painting. But, um, yeah. you know, being in a position where you can build that trust and rapport with your clients, absolutely essential. So I just wanted to flag that because I this is something that I see you're, you're doing so well. I mean, there's a photograph on your website uh, of, of the beautiful wrapping and the presentation mm-hmm. of this product. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's something I try and take pride in because I do think that things leave a lasting impression, especially things like in this day and age, as I said, art is a luxury item and you want people to to think that it is definitely a luxury item. And, you know, it's not, I'm very, very grateful to everyone who does like buy something, but not only buy something, but comments and follows and, you know, is, is supportive of the work because arguably without them, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are because, I think, but the difficulty is, is that without having a gallery presence or without being a published artist, you do rely heavily on on people through social media, which is, I think, where I'm going to come on to now with with some of the problems. Is that I mean, I get can sometimes get into a very difficult mindset with it that I kind of feel like I've got to be producing artwork every single day whether I like it or not now, I'm very fortunate I don't really feel like I've got an, I don't ever have an off day from art I always want to draw there's never a day where I think I really really can't face drawing today because I'm and I think that's I get a lot of people that say how do you stay so motivated when I do little Q&A's on Instagram people say how do you stay so motivated and I'm like oh it's you guys you motivate me because you're incredible and you you know, give me so much love and you give me so much support and you know I get so many messages on a daily basis about the work and I think oh my word like and I think it's only when you kind of sit there and you think I'm actually 
producing something that people like and people want and I think that's a bit mind-blowing because four years ago my name was completely well still is relatively unknown and a funny story there actually I um went to um I recently got asked to be at a local county show with my work which is a huge honor and it was an incredible experience um but one of they had a local publisher there um which was actually the very first publisher that I approached years ago who rejected me and but it's a different guy and um he came and had a chat with me and he had a chat about my work and the way that I'd done things and he basically said oh you're charging too much money considering you're a completely unknown artist and I was a bit like oh oh well I, I, I'm, un I'm unknown to you doesn't mean I'm unknown to the thousands of people that follow my work who buy it regularly so just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean I'm completely unknown so thank you very much and see you later uh, but it's one of those interesting situations that I think like oh you know you can take one little knock to me and it ruined my day I'm not gonna lie that ruined my day because I was thinking oh well he's the publisher he thinks it's good but wow. he wouldn't like have it in his house and I'm like oh okay but wow. you know I think that's because he was another person who was like oh I think you should learn to paint in oils because it's so much quicker and like who really wants to spend the time to no one's gonna buy buy work done by colored pencil because it takes so long and I've proved him wrong I'm trying to prove him wrong every single day trying to prove him wrong but yeah, coming back to what I sort of initially started saying was like, I think this is the problem with social media is that because I'm a bit addicted to it. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And I'm so embarrassed to say that I'm slightly addicted to social media, but I, I actually am because it's, you know, you read um, or you listen to people who say, oh, young people are addicted to their phones. Well, I'm absolutely addicted to Instagram. That's really embarrassing yeah. to say. Yeah. But Don't it, be embarrassed, so but I, I, I totally relate. Yeah. It's, it's awful, mm. you know, and it's like I try and put a new thing up every single day because I'm like, oh, well, my Instagram's grown like mm. like 2,000 last week. I'm like, excellent, but I need to keep that going. I need to keep yeah. that momentum. You need to keep – and you can't just put anything up there. You've got to make it really, really good content so you're consistently yeah. like – like I will mm. – let myself like not go to the gym for a week just so I can do make sure that I've got consistent Instagram posts. Yeah. And that is awful to say, but – it's yeah. so yeah what, what are your thoughts on that because well, uh, uh, well, how you're <laughs> no it's it's that's it, it's a quagmire you know it, it is something that is really difficult to navigate nowadays because i don't think we've never had this in the history of the world yeah, and absolutely. human beings and our physiology and the way our brain is set up i don't think we're prepared to to mentally you know physically handle what social media gives us and it gives us as creators I, and we'll speak specifically about creators here my feeling is is that what social media does is a bit like what sales do it's immediate feedback from an external source and the minute you get that feedback from something that's external you're no longer paying attention to what is internal and the driving force behind every artist, in my opinion, should always be what's internal, should be scratching the creative itch for you. I'm trying now, and again, I totally relate to what you're saying, because as, as, as much as I say that, I do find myself addicted, addicted to um, you know, the phone and, and wanting to check who's liked, who's commented, got to okay. get back to this person, got to, got to make sure I don't leave them hanging. Now, I'm trying to get in the habit of post and drop, drop the phone, mm -hmm. just, just put it away. I'll come back when it's my scheduled time to come back. My mm -hmm. thinking there is I'm not being rude. I'm not being mean. I love each and every one of my followers and subscribers. I'm, I'm totally grateful to them. And they also, a large portion of those people make my life possible. They, they yeah. actually really make my life possible. They, they, they keep the lights on. The, the pot boiling and the, and the, the heaters on and they, they keep the rent paid and help me do what I do. And, and through that, I'm also trying to provide my service and, and, and help teach people how to paint as well as sell paintings. So it, it's, it's difficult. I don't want to be ungrateful to them. But at the same time, I think at the end of the day, the true fans want to know that you are 100% and your tank is full enough to the point of being overflowing that mm. you must go and do that that thing that is the reason they're following you in the first place so 
I'm now going to be using, instead of being used by social media, I'm going to use it. Yeah. So I'm just trying to turn it around because the, the people, the directors at Facebook, and there was a director that came out, and again, I forget his name. I did speak about this on the podcast earlier um, uh, in another episode. But the director came out, and he, they, they were admitting, yeah, we made it addictive. The color yeah. was, was a marketing decision based on what people responded to most. The sound of the pop or the ding or the bell or whatever it is, the way the notification appears, it's like, Oh, you got a message. You got a message. You got a message. Oh, pay yeah. attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. And dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Yeah. And no wonder we're hooked on it. And so the the only way that I could kind of get around that was to just basically go, go to war with it and just go, no, I am not. I'm not giving in at all. So th- this is a position I find myself in now, you know, post and drop come back during my scheduled time to answer yeah. people on Instagram, which is normally in the evening, right before I go to bed. If other people that are listening to this are finding that they have the difficulty of putting it out there, try and keep this at arm's length. Try and do this in such a way where you're using it and it's not using you. Make a yeah. post, drop the phone, get on with your work, come back at a scheduled time, answer your comments, respond to your messages, make another post, drop the phone again. Uh, that's the only way I think that, because I, I think nowadays as an artist, through diversification, trying to make a, a living through different mediums, we have to, we, we need the internet, we need social media platforms to be able to make this work. So there's no sense in, in not using it, just use it responsibly. The reason why that people, so, so many people strive for realism now is because people will scroll through on social media and if they see something completely abstract, they're not going to stop. If they see something real, they're going to go, oh, my God, is that drawing? And then they'll follow. And I think that is a difficulty that compared to, like, before social media came out, there was a lot more, I think, maybe I don't really follow it that closely, but like more abstract paints, more sort of um, just people are doing a lot looser work compared to the intense realism that is on, on Instagram and on social media now. Um, and I, I just strongly just think that is because it's just seen as the thing to that it's, it's a craze it, compared to you know when I first started it, it, relatively short time ago as I said four years ago there's so many more people that are doing exactly what I do now and it's I mean I, I'm all for it because I'm just like oh you know there's a not I, I always say so recently about a couple of months ago I did start a YouTube channel I, I did a few videos and kind of realized that it took too, way too much time and I kind of just gone that that can that can wait I can do that some other time so it's very difficult to I don't know put very abstract work but I, I do like online because it's such an unknown but I mean I think for me one thing that I did say to people who watched those videos and followed what I was talking about on there I just said there is an audience out there for everyone if someone wants to do realism you crack on you do that because even though realism is meant to be realistic there's so many different forms and so many different styles of that realism that there is and there's so many different price brackets you've got people who will buy your work if you're charging 20 pound 30 pound for a little uh, for like a study there's people that would charge like two three thousand pounds or 20 or thirty thousand pounds there is an audience for absolutely everyone no matter where you are in the journey or on your creative business journey there is a market for absolutely everyone and I think that was one thing that I really wanted to sort of hone in on and and try and because I do have a lot of people that say oh I'm just starting out and I don't know how much I should charge and I'm like I've been doing this four years and I still don't know how much to charge but I think there is an audience there for everyone I couldn't agree more. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's room for everyone. And that, that's this is one of the reasons I don't like uh, competition or thinking about it as as competition. Uh, I, I'm in t- And again, I'm in two minds about that because I might sound like I'm contradicting myself. There is competition in, ser- in terms of when you're marketing your original work and you're competing for people's attention you know, on, on the, the private sales market, you know, are they going to spend that amount of money on my painting or are they going to buy somebody else's? Fortunately for me, I only need to, I only need 25 people a year to make the decision to buy one of my pieces. And there's certainly more than enough to go around. 
you know, what, you're, you're still putting yourself out there online, you know, despite all the pitfalls with social media, despite all of that, you're still using this as a medium to reach people. But you've been doing some things recently where you're actually reach, reaching out on a much more personal level and actually interacting with people live. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it was about three, four months ago, I decided to bite the bullet and uh, to start a YouTube channel. Uh, I had so many people requesting videos, whether it was time lapses or just Q&As and things like that. Like, um, And I was like, oh, okay, well, I, about two years ago, I went and bought this vlogging camera and it sat in its box ever since because I was so scared um because it's one thing i mean you can, you can completely hide behind your work to a certain degree on on social media like no one really has to know you um and then my parents kind of said to me well maybe it'd be a good idea to to try and eventually do the videos because then people can buy into you as a person and it creates and you know because it's one of those things i mean when you do when for me when i do like a trade show or a show of any description you know your personality sells you as much as your artwork i think anyway um and a lot of you know you, people don't understand that and they don't get that on instagram or facebook so i thought right okay i'm, I'm gonna do a start a youtube channel so i um i sent my family out for the day. i still live at home so i sent my uh, my parents and my brother out and i said that i'm gonna film a video can you just disappear for a bit because i'm probably gonna absolutely mess it up so i'm just gonna you know just need a very very silent house so so, so, so what what did i do i um I went onto Instagram and I asked a load of questions. I just, I said, well, you know, ask me, put on one of those little Q and A sticker things on your story. And I said, look, can people just ask me whatever they want to know? And I'll sit down, and I'll do film a YouTube video. Um, and I had some amazing questions. And so I just screenshot them and sat them down and I had a, this camera in front of me. It was a Sunday morning. I had this camera in front of me. I kind of was staring at it going, I have no idea what I'm going to say to you and I've got no idea how, whether I'm going to come across coherent or, you know, I haven't had to talk to anyone in years about what I, not really about, you know, on this much of a personal level, because it's one thing, as I said, hiding behind your artwork and it's another thing putting yourself, your personality and who you are out, out on film. And yeah, I think, it, I, I mean, I just had to think in my head, there's edit, there's edit, there's edit, and you can edit the bits you don't like. Um, and some of the questions on there were, were quite, I can't remember some of my head what they were, but some of them were m on more of a personal level, really, about sort of like not only just how did you start, obviously, the business, but like how do you cope with the pressure of social media? Um, and how do you sort of balance multiple platforms? How do you, because I mean, one of the reasons why I started uh, really, really getting into drawing like I did was after all those sort of fallouts that we've spoken about previously. Um, I kind of started suffering quite badly from anxiety and um, I knew that I wasn't very good at going into an office or doing it and doing a normal job so I was like right okay I've got to make this artwork work for me um, and from having quite an anxious mind and thinking oh god what if no one likes it or not no one likes it obviously you sit in front of a camera you think I could lose people I could lose a following like I could lose you know, what if no one watches it and but, you know, I, I answered the videos and I had a bit of a laugh at myself and I kind of just was just like trying to laugh my three, way through this video. And I think the first cut that I took was probably I was talking at the camera for about well over an hour. And I remember sitting there, stitching it all up together and editing it and thinking, oh, yeah, that was actually OK. I didn't mess it up as much as I thought. And but and it was interesting, actually, because I, the amount of comments that I get on social media on, on those YouTube videos was, wow, I love how open and honest you were about sort of whether it's a review of, of some of the brands I work, uh, like not work with, but some of the brands I use for my artwork or, um, or how you cope with feeling like an anxious day or what do you do when you're feeling not 100%? How do you keep motivated? How do you? And um, I, I found it quite refreshing. Um, and I was a bit like, oh, well, you know, people are actually interested. They're not, they're not judging me for feeling like this. In fact, they feel it too. And we can talk about this. And I kind of said in that video, I was like, I want to be an open space for people to talk about mental health because it's something that's really prevalent now. And I didn't want to be, I don't want to be just like sat behind my artwork and feel like people can't approach me and ask me questions. And yeah, it might take me about a week to get back to you sometimes because I'm terrible with like replying to people sometimes. But, you know, I wanted them to 
that feel that they could relate and it wasn't just um, a polished piece of artwork that they were seeing there was actually like a person behind it um, who had the same struggles that they were facing on a personal level and then, so I, I remember filming this video and I pressed publish and people were so so supportive and I put like a little minute clip on my Instagram being like I am so nervous and all of this um, and then I put on my story I spoke I spoke on my story for the first time ever and I've had Instagram for like four years and people are like, well, we're really grateful that you, you are that open and honest and you shared your experiences. And I think, you know, that is one of the benefits of having social media. That That is brilliant. And again, I can totally, totally relate to that. Absolutely. Um, I... I think there there is a, a huge stigma around that these days. A lot of people are... A lot of people are out there kind of suffering in silence in a way. And I think social media is one of those things. I mean, it seems we're, we're talking about this so much. I mean, social media is one of those things that exacerbates the problem. It doesn't really help if you've already got that streak in you. And, and again, I do exactly like you. I have that streak, totally anxious person. Um, mm. And people, I don't think after about four years now, coming up on nearly four years of being um, in front of that camera, it still takes me 45 minutes to get five minutes of content. Really? It takes me a long time. Most of it ends up on the editing floor. And and people then comment, they're like, wow, your videos, they help. They're great. They're so well polished. You're such a good communicator. Uh, check out all of the rushes first <laughs> before you say that, because yeah. most of it just doesn't make it into the cut. You know, again, there's there's power in the edit, but it, there might be some people out there listening, going, "All right, guys, well, this is a bit rich. You know, your your social media following is is pretty vast compared to most people, and here you are, you know, complaining about how hard it is." I think that a, a lot of people, most people are cool, but a lot of people do forget you're a real person, you're a mm. real person, and you go through real things, and you're just like them. And I think that's important that we realize that we're all in this together and, you know, good on you. I think that's, it's incredibly brave to step in front of that camera and face those demons because they're, they're reflected right back at you in that little circular mirror, like polish in the lens. It's staring right back at you. You got, I am not cut out for this and everything starts flooding back to you in in that moment. Um, Mm but it's important to show up because it's the people for me, I'll tell you what it is for me that keeps me going, you know, a bit like you, for me, it's the people that email that say, I have not picked up the brushes in 45 years. I saw one of your videos and now I'm painting again. Yeah. I mean, it is something that I think a lot of people like struggle with. And and that's why I said, like, social media and instagram is, is such like a, is a demon but then again it's such an open platform where people can communicate and share their battles and it should be seen as that um and people should you know have an open space to be able to talk about you know whether it's battles in art whether it's personal battles if they're going through like a hardship and and they find artwork because because that's what artwork was for me it was just like an escapism um and it kind of just rolled and rolled and rolled and i kind of just like luckily fortunately like just started growing and I know I know I had a very fortunate break and you know I've had some very very as I said like very um, fortunate opportunities Um, but at the end of the day you're still someone who sat at home in a studio on your own 90% of every day with just yourself and your thoughts and it can be hard That's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because that's one that I personally was not prepared for. Um, mm. But I hear from so many other people out there going, do you get lonely? I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I really do. Because it's been me in a room by myself for over a decade. Do you know what that yeah. does to a person? Like, I mean, it's not quite solitary confinement, but you are you are in your head for, for, for a long period, long periods of time during the day where you won't speak to anybody. And so, you know, there was a friend of mine, a really dear friend of mine, uh, I miss him terribly, but um, his name was Matt Doust. And he was a, a famous par- uh, artist from, from Perth in Western Australia, who's unfortunately no longer with us. But I remember Matt, um, you know, so fondly. And, and I remember this, this time I went to go and see him at his studio. And uh, he had this sign on the back wall of his studio, because I think he was going through this as well. 
and it said, art is lonely, get used to it. I'm like, yeah. word, brother, <laughs> word, yeah. like that is, and, and it's something that I've, I've always struggled with, but how do you, Bethany, kind of, did you find that you went through a transition period where you kind of announced to the world, oh yeah, I'm going to be an artist. Did you find you had people kind of drop out of your life? I mean, in addition to the challenges, how did this affect you on a personal level by going into something that was a solitary occupation? Um, I think because when I, as I said, when I was at, at school, well, when I was in the workplace, as I said, I was obviously working in, in the motor train in the corporate environment and going to uni, you're with, you know, friends every single day. It's just like when you're at school. But I was almost like I, I struggled massively at school. I was quite, um, I guess, seen as like the crazy horse girl because there is one at every single school. And I think I was probably that person. Um, and I was quite isolated. And I always really struggled with socializing on that kind of level. Um, and as I said, like way back when we first started talking, it was just like it was difficult to when all my friends were like, oh, do you want to go to the pub for the weekend? And I'll be like, mm, no, not really. Um, or do you want to come to a party? And, no, not really. And it's it's hard because you know, you do lose friends, you do lose people, and you think and people think, oh, you're not cool, so you know you just want to sit at home and draw. But I tell you what, the people that have left my life. I've made up some, like, the people who have come into my life through doing the artwork and through, as I said, my the, one of my best friends is a photographer working with the team GB up in Gloucester. It's, it, you know, you meet so, so many people. And I'll tell you one of the biggest things for me that, that changes and it keeps me going as much as my social media following does is that I've only done two big events. And one of them was a horse show called Your Horse Live, um, which is a, up north from me and it happens every November um and I it was my first trade stand I've ever done and I had a little three meter by three meter and I just think I was, it was back in 2017 and I spent about three months prepping for this because I had like a there was secrets like not secrets there was stuff going on in the background too which is like part of the reason I was there um so I had a lot of prep work that I had to do for this and it was um a huge amount of graft it was a huge amount of work and it was very nerve-wracking because it was again another massive expense you didn't know whether it was going to pay off um and I remember setting up and thinking oh my god have I done the right thing like who's going to come and see me I've put it all over social media like people you know I, I, I was just scared basically um and I wake up the next the first day of the event I got to the event and I think I'd been there about 45 minutes and I had two people come up, oh we follow you on social media we love what you do and that just continued and you know people and people from there had you know they kept coming and talking and just were, took such an interest and that would then message me saying oh it's lovely to meet you today at your horse live or lovely to meet you and they make up for the loneliness like the hours of graft that goes in when you're sat on your own doing the work and then you take your work out publicly like for me I get such a high out of it and I mean you kind of forget the high because I did as I said this trade event in your hall uh, in 2017 and then I didn't do another big one until uh beginning of this month and um I was in so the county show that I've just done I was in the judges and stewards area um so I was very very restricted to, to the fitfall in there but I got to meet sort of the chairman, the vice chairman of the show, and they were incredibly kind, incredibly generous. They, you know, there's, uh, they sort of had messaged, added me on Facebook, messaged me afterwards saying it was lovely to have you there. We hope you enjoyed it. And it was just the connections that you make through through putting your work out there and putting yourself out there. Uh, I'm like, you, well, you just can't compare it to, you know, to the friends that you lose at school because you think, well, you know, you're not meant to be in my life. If, you, if you're going to you're going to run away at the first hurdle, then you know, who are you and do I really want you in my life? Well, no, I probably don't. Uh, I, I can relate to that again, 100 um, percent where I, I, you know, there would be the party going on or would you come to the bar or, you know, and I, I did do that for a period of time in my early 20s, you know, the party and the drink and then the carrying on. And then as you shed these people out of your life and, and you're it's it's hard to 
it's hard to, I heard this said once, the first, I heard Kyle Cease say this. Kyle Cease is a comedian and he's a bit one of these kind of motivator, inspirational dudes. And mm -hmm. he said, you can always measure what you're gonna lose, but you can never measure what you're going to gain, which means you can quantify yeah, you, you can quantify in that moment, I'm going to lose this person. Well, that means I lose the bar, the parties, something to do when I'm bored. And, and that feels like a genuine loss. But what you don't, what you can't anticipate, what you, you, you just have no idea what's around the corner of what's coming in. And one of the things that, that we know from just from life is that nature abhors a vacuum. It just will not tolerate a vacuum there will always be something that comes in and fills an empty space. So if you create those empty spaces within your life, you're then, and you raise your standards when you do that, then mm. something else has got to come in and fill that. And what yeah. happens for me is that those people have been replaced with genuine people. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And I kind of think like that uh, some of the people that when I was out sort of drinking and sort of being a youth and, and I think, you know they're probably very happy and I'm very very happy for them that you know but I don't know I think it takes takes someone I think for me if I think about my friendship group now we are all self-employed we're all pretty creative and we all have we're all stupidly ambitious like we set our goals up here and I think most people who I left behind are it sounds bad, but it's still way down here. No, I, I get it. No, you're, you're right. I mean, it's it's those people. And, and it's the people that, that maybe didn't have an intention or set a goal for, for their life. Uh, normally, those two, two of those people can't be in the same room at the same time. Somebody with ambition and somebody without. It's just, it doesn't yeah. work. Because you're just like, okay, next. But while we're, while we're on that subject, because I'm a big time goal setter. Uh, and I, I love goals. I write them down. I schedule them. I commit action daily to achieving them. Tell me about, you know, some of your goals. If you feel comfortable sharing with with us yeah. an example of a goal and maybe like you, you set goals and write them down, right? Do you know what? I don't. How dare you? <laughs> I, no, no, it's bad. Um, no, I don't. Um, I think it's because I'm, it sounds really weird, but I'm still completely overwhelmed so it's been four years i'm sure. still completely overwhelmed that people actually take an interest in my work um we'll get used because, to it. It, it no oh, i can't <laughs> um, but you know two years ago i got the gold medalist world champion address arch as a client from there i you know i did um her trainer the the champion of champion address arch carl hester i got his I was commissioned to do his 50th birthday present on behalf of one of the biggest equestrian shows in the UK and present it in front of him and thousands of other people. Uh, you know, that I've worked with uh, some of the biggest companies who have commissioned the horse feed companies. I have I've run a competition with them every year and to for one of their followers to win a, a portrait. Um, I've worked with Occlusive Brush Company and Occlusive do the most phenomenal grooming brush, horse brushes that are owned by you know, the top grooms. You know, they commissioned me to do one of the top traveling grooms of the in the UK. His um his birthday present too. Um, the the amount of like even being asked to be at the county show uh, is it because that that new for the New Forest and Hampshire County Show is a is a show that I've adored since I was very very little. Um, and to be invited to be there was a huge privilege. Um, and I think. I mean, oh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you kind of think, oh, well, it'd be nice to get a royal commission, maybe, like because obviously the royal family in the UK is 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 a huge deal. It's what what we're made for, apparently, what we're known for. Um, and the queen has corgis and she has a lot of ponies, so that would that would be cool. Um, but in all honesty, I think I I roll with the punches. I take each day as it comes because each day gives me a new challenge. It gives me something new to accomplish. I think it would be amazing if I was to set goals, maybe. But I take opportunities as they come, and I kind of go, "Is this right for me? Yes, it is. I'm going to take it and just see how far I can push that opportunity and see how much I can get out of it and see what doors that opens." Um, I think for me, because so many people told me I couldn't do what I what I do now, that it was 
very very difficult to be like okay well not only am I going to make this a success but I'm going to make it such a success that I'm going to work with x and y and z client that was never never even crossed my mind so obviously to get to, to work with the clients that I do work with is phenomenal and then to sort of to to be asked well what are your goals you work with these people so what do you want now and I'm like oh I, I really don't know I should, I should probably know but in all honesty I just take each day as it comes and see what opportunities come my way that's extraordinary yeah no I, I totally yeah I can appreciate that mindset and just because you're, you're just gratefully putting one foot in front of the, the other and just capitalizing yeah. on the opportunities that you're given I, I, yeah. I like that I like that a lot maybe I could use a bit more of a, a good dose of that with what I'm doing um no that's really really cool I, I would love to, I, again, I, I really appreciate your time, Bethany. Uh, evening, your time, it's, it's early in the morning here in New Zealand. I, I really have enjoyed this. I, I would love to just kind of ask a few other questions. I mean, we've, yeah, gone, cool. we've gone everywhere in this, in this podcast, and I love this. And this is a whole idea of the podcast is it's, it's a conversation. It's a back and forth. And, you know, I find that whenever my guest brings up something, normally I end up kind of jumping on that and, and go, we go down a rabbit hole. But I, I, I've loved the, the deeper dive into social media and the, the mental health side of things as well. I want to bring it back a little bit, if we can, to the, mm-hmm. to the, the business side of art. And, and again, kind of how, how you're making this work as a business. And maybe we can frame this in such a way, because I, I'm, I know you get a lot of people who are coming to you, in particular, a lot of younger people as well, who come to you and they're like, hey, Bethany, maybe you could give me some business advice. So if you were to offer advice, if you saw somebody that had talent and promise and, and showed some ability, what, what kind of, maybe just as general as you like, but what kind of advice would you be able to give the, get out there to, to people who are wanting to consider becoming a professional artist? But to be honest, in, from my personal experience, a lot of people will say to me, "Are you? did you go to school? Like, well, obviously I went to school, but did you go to art school? No, I didn't. So how did you get to where you were? Social media. So I think for me, if show up, show up every single day, try and produce artwork to some degree every single day, hone your skill, hone your talent, and be patient, be pra- like be practical about it. Don't expect things like to happen overnight because if they do, incredible for you, but the chances are they won't. So don't set your goals too high and don't, ex- like, I mean, I, I preach about being sort of grateful for the opportunity. I think I've said fortunate in your podcast about a million times, but I genuinely, that's how I feel. Um, and that's what I, that's coming back to like the goal setting. I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I take each day as it comes and I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. And I think if someone has talent and they have ambition and they have drive and they know what they want to do and if art and sort of pencil art or whatever form of art and you've got a skill, hone it, run with it, see how far you can take it. That's all I, I think because that's, that's, in all honesty, that's all I'm doing. I haven't got an end goal in mind. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but I know I can get up and I'm going to draw. That's all I know. And it's working. It's a system and it seems to work every day. Okay. Yeah. As I said to you earlier, I kind of um, try and produce a new P or have some updated content to put on Instagram every single day or on Facebook and things like that, which does hold me accountable. I think, you know, if you turn, if, if someone can turn around to you and say, I want to be an artist and I, you know, and that's what I said, show up, make yourself accountable and keep drawing, just keep drawing. No matter what happens, do not let anyone burst your creative bubble because if they do, it takes a long time to get it back. I mean, I've, as, as we know, like, and I'm sure you have too, had a lot of knocks in the past sort of like however many years. Um, but if you can overcome that and think, do you know what? That's one person. The same with the negative comments. One person who thinks that, maybe two at the most. It doesn't matter. There are thousands, millions, billions of people in the world. You know, people, regardless of the work you produce, whether it's realism, whether it's not realism, someone will love what you do. Someone will like you for you. And you've just got to find your audience. And social media is great for that. And it takes patience, it takes graft, it takes a huge amount of work to make anything worthwhile. 
but if you can keep going and keep keep yourself motivated just keep yourself as I said show up keep yourself accountable and just keep just honing your skill honing your talent you know whether whether that's you know searching for other people on YouTube you know for or on Instagram and things like that to help uh, inspire you at the end of the day there are thousands of people making careers as artists or not only artists but like podcasters or creative people or like um and if they can do it then why can't you at the end of the day you know it takes I mean I don't really so a lot of people say to me well you must have had a skill you must be talented naturally and I think well if you look back at the work that I did when I was like 16 17 you wouldn't think I was particularly talented but I've spent eight years grafting to get to the level of re- and I think do I think it comes naturally I, I think you've got to have it's I think I think personally it's a personality trait you've got to be prepared to put the hours in if you're prepared to put the hours in and be patient and willing to make mistakes willing to for people to be negative then you'll you will be successful um and I think that is, yeah, I mean, I think that's all you can say about it, really. I think what's important for people to hear from your story is is that there is no substitute for time, you know, and maybe maybe people wouldn't have recognized your capacity early on, but you you had enough of that seed of inspiration there in the beginning to just go, you know what, I'm doing this. And you just one hour after another hour after another hour, pretty soon it's been years but I, I I think as well as as thing as well as time you it's you kind of almost as you said you kind of got to be slightly obsessed you have to because it, without passion without a love for it you, you won't I mean so when I was at, at uni and I was studying marketing um in my second year they asked me to do um, a like a semester on project management something I had absolutely zero interest in and therefore did I do it? No. Did I fail? Pretty much. Could I Could I even get my head around it? No. Because my brain isn't wired like that. But if I know that I'm, I've set myself a goal, so I'm almost coming back to goals, I wanted to get my work to as realistic as I possibly can to get the top clients. Um, and it's funny, actually, because people who know my work like for some of the top clients that I do work with they will almost be like oh don't use that photo because the horse doesn't look quite right in that photo and I'm thinking oh it's an artistic interpretation and they're like well no because you'll draw it as close to the photo as I possibly can a fair photo isn't dead on for the horse's composition they won't let me use it which is interesting um but yeah I think if you've got a passion if you've got a love and if you've got a sort of commitment you've just got to be committed to it to to your skill and to your talent and yeah time is invaluable but if you want something bad enough you'll make it work and I truly believe that uh, again I agree with you 100% <laughs> this is this has been a wonderful conversation I've really enjoyed this um, thank you, thank you. I um I, I like asking this question in the creative endeavor podcast it's a silly question but um I'm always surprised by the answers that I get, and I find that um, they're, they're always very interesting. I, I'm I'm in two minds about it as to what I'd do, but let let me let me just go ahead and ask you the question: If you had the opportunity to go back and sit down with Bethany as a ten-year-old girl, and you were going to yeah. offer some words of wisdom, what would you say? Oh God. <laughs> um, probably I'd probably start off by saying don't be so harsh and it's something my mum always tells me even now don't be so harsh on yourself you take things so seriously I'm such a sensitive person and knowing if I knew myself at 10 years old now knowing what hardship was going to come just take things as a pinch of salt nothing is as bad as what it seems you will get over you know the heartache you'll get over being you know having your work criticized you'll get over losing money there, there's ample money in the world there's ample opportunity there is ample you know you you're so fortunate you've got a support network just be patient i think that's what i keep honing on and i know i keep saying it but yeah just just show up be accountable put your work out there do not be afraid to share your work with other people 
and you will find your audience. If you want to be, a, a, you know, if you want something bad enough, you'll make it work. If you want to be an artist and you are unsure about where to start, just just show up just share your work you know whether it's even just a pet on a personal Facebook level just you can be like uh upload uh, upload a photo of your work and be like hey guys like um I'm just starting out as an artist um I'd love to hear what you think please you know go easy on me because it is a bit new to me um but I, I would love to hear what you think okay yes it does open you up a little bit to criticism but at the end of the day you've got you know you have to put your work out there in order to be to to build a portfolio because you can be an artist you will sit um but in a studio behind closed doors for years and if you don't put your work out there if you don't show it whether it's online or to a gallery now I think personally being online is not as hard as being in a gallery but that's my personal opinion I've just had some very horrible experience with publishers um but I think yeah if you if you can do that then good on you and just keep keep doing that basically and yeah it will it will pay off hard work always pays off if you want something hard enough you'll make it work if you, yeah if you love it keep going well bethany veer this has been a huge pleasure thank you so much for being on this episode i've really enjoyed it thank you so much for having me i've absolutely loved this brilliant to talk to someone who's like-minded absolutely brilliant wonderful and all the best with your work and your career thank you and to you Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast and a huge thank you to Bethany Veer for joining me. Now, of course, you can find Bethany on Instagram at Bethany Veer underscore art and on her website, www.bethanyveerart.co.uk. And I've put those links in the description down below. Now, if you like this podcast, then click that like button for me. And if you want to come back for more and see more podcasts just like this one or some of my painting tutorials, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel. As always, I can be found on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thank you so much for stopping by and I'll see you again soon.